It's Tuesday, July 21st, 2020 Digital Trends Live is about to start. Here are some of the topics we're covering on today's episode of the show. Another setback for Amazon's annual Prime Day sales event was announced as safety concerns surrounding COVID-19 force them to move dates. We'll let you know the details. And Mr. Drew Prindle is also back in action with another edition of Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet as he takes a look at some of the greatest and maybe weirdest crowdfunding campaigns that are out there. And one of our guests has not only played Mark Antony, but also a cult leader. It's James Purifoy who will be here to talk about his new movie, Fisherman's Friends, releasing on digital on July 24th. And we'll have another edition of Who's Got Game, a segment where we partner with full screen talent to interview YouTube creators, gamers, and entertainers. And today, we'll be joined by Reggie Weber. All of that and more on today's episode of Digital Trends Live. Hello, this is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and again, thank you for joining us wherever you are. We appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button. Join the show here every day as we keep you up to date on everything that's going on in the world of technology. And let's do that here right out of the gate and talk about some tech news, some trending tech news at that. And the first off is this. Prime Day is an event that normally takes place over one day or last year, two days uh, during July. Amazon doesn't have an official date for it, but generally speaking, it's July. Well, it was already pushed back once to possibly August, now pushed back again and that is because of concerns around COVID-19 safety of getting all this all these products out to people and of course their employees so this is what's happening with Amazon saying this again it's estimated there's guesses that it's going to be around October 5th now that is not something that Amazon has said explicitly but that is uh, something that's coming out from third-party sellers who are saying that's when they expect it's going to happen but again this is a huge event to just kind of emphasize what this is I mean this is essentially the size of Black Friday this is a big event where they've gone from one day to two days uh, we don't know how many days it was going to be this year but they are going to continue on with the sales event that's going to be going on in India but as far as the United States and the general Prime Day it is going to be delayed so uh, expecting maybe October 5th but certainly a big uh, move there and for third-party sellers who look to sell a lot of items on that day this is a very big uh, economic has a very big economic impact for them but again Amazon saying because of concerns of COVID-19 they are delaying it one more time the date we're hearing is October 5th, but Prime Day delayed once again. Continuing on with trending news, let's talk about something else with Amazon, and that is the expansion of robot delivery tests. So this is something they've been doing for a while. They had tested it out in Snohomish County in Washington. There's also some tests going on in California. Now they're expanding these tests to uh, Atlanta and also to Tennessee. So Atlanta, Georgia, Franklin, Tennessee, two places where they're going to be getting the Scout robot. So there it is, kind of looks like a cooler on wheels, and this is an autonomous thing that would deliver packages to you. Uh, they are going to have what they're calling a, a Scout uh, representative uh, who is going to be with them. Uh, a scout ambassador, excuse me, uh, that's going to be with them because of the fact that they're still testing this out. So they'll have somebody walking along with it as it makes these deliveries, but this is something that rolling out to other places, they do see the advantage of these autonomous deliveries. And they're not the only company that's working on things like this, but certainly Amazon being one of the biggest retailers in the world, uh, this is a pretty big move. So as they test these out, we would expect to maybe see more of this. There are some benefits to that as far as exposure to COVID-19 and different things like that for the drivers, but this is something that Amazon's working on. They did say that also with, uh, they're gonna be looking to local schools in Atlanta and Franklin to support STEM and robotics activities. So they're looking for uh, people to actually help out with this and uh, maybe increase some education when it comes to uh, STEM and robotics. So looking for the quote, next generation of innovators in both cities. That's something you can read more about at digitaltrends.com. Continuing on with trending news, uh, movie theaters were originally planning to open June, then July, now it keeps getting pushed back, obviously, here in the United States, at least because of concerns of COVID-19 and what regulations are allowing for. So Tenet, being this movie that was going to be the first blockbuster to come out, is now pushed back again. This is the third or fourth time, I would say at least, uh, that's been pushed back. Now they're saying that uh, they don't even have a date. Originally, it was going to be August 12th now. That this was the latest date, rather. And now they're delaying the film until at least September, they said. This uh, comes with a couple of different things. There's also a couple of our August films that will most likely be delayed, and that's The New Mutants and Mulan from Disney. Um, there is the possibility that Tenet, though, could open in other places around the world and not the United States, which would be um, a different kind of move, where this would open up 
worldwide, and then they would wait until theaters can handle it here in the United States to open. And that's because of the fact that Christopher Nolan refuses and will not, by all accounts, allow this to go to a digital or streaming only platform. But it's another sign of the fact that movie theaters are being pushed back. A couple of things with Tenet. Um, it is, uh, there, there's something interesting with China, as far as China, China being the world's second largest movie market. This is a huge market for Hollywood movies. Uh, but there's an issue there with the runtime. So Tenet runs at about two and a half hours long. And Chinese regulations for them opening up their theaters are that movies have to be two hours or less because of social distance laws. So how Tenet would handle that? Um, that's an interesting concern. And also, is that something that we could see United States theaters adopting? Hard to say, but a lot to kind of infer with that. A lot of information that will be coming out, uh, but following along with that tenant being delayed. You can read more about it at digitaltrends.com. Continuing on with trending news, let's talk about Gmail, something that a lot of us are on all the time. And with this increased use of online meetings and virtual meetings and Zoom, well, Google has Meet. And Meet is something that is now rolling out for more people to utilize. So they're saying it's a liable choice for video calls during the pandemic. And this is going to be showing up now as part of the Gmail app for iOS and Android. So iOS users actually got access to it, uh, I believe, before. Uh, now Android, though, or Android users are going to get it as well. So uh, officially, if you don't subscribe to G Suite, your calls will be limited to 60 minutes, but that rule is not going to be enforced until September 30th. That's when they'll make you subscribe if you want to do longer than 60 minutes. But it's a competitor essentially to Zoom, to um, all kinds of the, the other apps that are out there to, uh, to facilitate these meetings. And uh, that is what Google's going to be having. But now they're going to make it easier and have it integrated right into Gmail. So that's an update you'll be seeing soon. And again, read more about that at digitaltrends.com. Continuing on, let's talk about some e-vehicles and how they are competing with gas vehicles, but in particular, these really fast ones. So here we go. We have got Ford with their Mustang Mach-E, which is due to be coming out later on. Well, now they've got a special version, which is the Mach-E 1400, which has 1400 horsepower. That is what it's got, 1400 horsepower. That is a very fast vehicle right there. They're showcasing it. Uh, there are a couple of interesting things with it. It's got seven electric motors. Um, they of course, made it more aerodynamic. It's got some different bodywork. It's got a massive rear wing, but it's got seven electric motors. They said it's got a top speed of around 160 miles per hour, and again, all electric. Uh, they haven't tested it for the quarter mile time for zero to 60, but uh, pretty impressive what they've come up with here. And there are some other cars that had that some other e-cars that have gone over a thousand horsepower, but this is the first one with these seven motors. Now it's not going to last very long. The way that they had to do the battery is it puts out a lot of power really quick. This isn't something that you would be using long term, obviously, but it's showcasing the power that they have. Ford is talking about entering into some e-races as well. So this is something that they could be joining. Uh, but yeah, kind of a, a cool video that they put out and just showcasing the power of electric vehicles and what they've been able to do with them so far. So again, that's the Ford Mach-E 1400. So read more about that at digitaltrends.com. And continuing on with our final trending news topic here for the top of the show, let's talk about SpaceX and another highly successful mission with a couple of firsts that happened yesterday. Now, this is setting up a South Korean uh, military satellite. So we didn't get to see the entire launch. Well, we got to see the launch, but we didn't get to see the deployment because South Korean military declined to have that uh, broadcast. But here are a couple of things that were the first. This was the fastest time that a Falcon 9 rocket was turned around and used again. So the last time this was used was actually to uh, send up the astronauts to the International Space Station. Now it uh, was used again. Uh, just 51 days later. So that's a pretty big move right there. And it also is, uh, is a first for the fact that both of the fairings, both of them were able to land successfully on those ships at sea. Sometimes we get one of them, the other one falls into the ocean, but they both landed on these barges with nets in the middle of the ocean. And that is a huge success because it saves a ton of money for one. Um, these things are about $6 million a piece and uh, the fact that they're able to save them both, clearly they're saving a lot of money, but also just the tech of being able to catch it. Pretty impressive what they were able to do. And there's a lot more coming up with space and SpaceX. They're going to be having some more launches to Starlink coming up, but still pretty cool first that happened right there. And you can read more about them at digitaltrends.com. It's now time for the, the product, product of, of the, the day. day. All right, our product of the day today is the DJ, DJI Mavic Air quadcopter with 
a remote controller. So this is the drone that you are looking for. So it's got a few different things. It's able to shoot horizontal, vertical, and 180 degree panoramas. It can stitch 25 photos together in eight seconds to create a 32 megapixel sphere panorama. It's lightweight, supports 4K video at 30 frames per second. It's got a 12 megapixel camera. Um, with Adobe DNG RAW support, so if you're shooting professional video, this would work for some of those. You can control your drone up to 6,562 feet away. So that's over a mile away you can control this drone. It's got 21 minutes of flight time, which is actually quite a bit when it comes to drones. And it's got all kinds of uh, different things with a detachable control stick. It's got a remote controller, a lot of things that come with this. And this is the DJI Mavic Air quadcopter with remote controller. It's in Onyx Black, and here's the deal which makes it the product of the day, it is 220 bucks off. Normally this thing's $919 on sale right now for $699. And you can get that deal by clicking that link that is below me to the side of me. Depends what platform you're watching on, but we got a link right there. Follow that link. That's how you take advantage of this deal. And again, save 220 bucks. That's 24% off the price of the DJI Mavic Air quadcopter with remote controller. That's our product of the day. All right, we got to get to a break because we're talking about some really great things here today. And coming up next, we're going to talk about how technology and artificial intelligence do not, not necessarily replace, but augment and help pathologists in the lab and also make things a lot safer for us. So we're going to talk about that coming up next. Stick around back in with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and again, thanks for joining us. Hit that subscribe button. Right now, we're going to talk about how technology and artificial intelligence cannot replace but help augment and assist with pathological diagnostics. And that's in part what we're going to discuss. We're joined now by the CEO of PAGE, Leo Grady. Leo, thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi, Greg. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited to talk about this FDA clearance that you've got. We're going to get to that here in a minute. But for everybody watching, can you give us a little bit of a backstory on PAGE and what all it is that you do? Absolutely. So we focus on pathology. And pathology is the branch of medicine where you take a piece of tissue out of a patient from a biopsy or surgery and look at it under a microscope in order to render a diagnosis and treatment plan for that patient. And what PAGE does is we provide technology to enable pathologists to look at those cases digitally and render a diagnosis from a digital image, as well as match patterns in that digital tissue to a large database of cancer and provide that information to doctors to help them render the right diagnosis and treatment plan for that patient. And from what I understand, that's been kind of an issue in that field because of interoperability concerns and different ways that this information is shared. So this, it, from what I understand, this creates kind of a level playing field where everybody can have access to the information. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So there, there's a variety of different uh, kinds of labs around the world. And particularly now in a COVID situation, many of them are struggling to have pathologists be able to work safely in the lab and to be able to help uh, provide those diagnoses and treatment plans for those patients. Nice, so this would help even that playing field a little bit and, and give everybody access to that remotely. That's great. Um, let, can we get a little bit of an idea of, of so far how this tech has been used and who has been uh, incorporating it in and maybe a little bit of what some of the results are from that? Yeah, we are, the FDA clearance that we announced today is for our digital slide viewer to enable pathologists to render a digital diagnosis from scans of a Philips uh, ultra-fast slide scanner. And the, the 
computational pathology technology that we've built has been demonstrated to and, and published uh, to help pathologists reduce the number of false negatives. In other words, to be able to find cancer that otherwise they may have missed. So this has the potential to not only speed up these diagnoses because of the sharing of the information, but also um, find new ways that maybe we weren't able to do before, if I'm understanding that correct. That's right. So by matching these patterns to the database of, of cancer that Paige has access to, we can provide that information to the pathologist during their diagnostic process and make that available to them. In addition, as I think you're alluding to, we've also started working with the biopharma industry to see whether there are patterns in these tissues and tumors that might provide information about what kinds of drugs are gonna be most effective for working on these patients' tumors and provide them the most uh, effective response to those medications. When we talk about the use of artificial intelligence in this, um, maybe you can walk us through how that works. And, and is it like a massive database that you have of collected information from previous diagnoses, or, and then you compare it to that, or, or how is, does that work, and how can it help augment these pathologists' work? Yeah, that's exactly right, Greg. So we come from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and which is one of the leading cancer hospitals in the world here in New York City. And we have access to that enormous database of the world's best pathologists and doctors rendering diagnoses for millions of patients. So what we're able to do is find these patterns in the tissue, in the tumors, match those patterns to that enormous database and bring that information to the fingertips of any pathologist around the world who may not have access to really not only find all of these these patterns but to be able to benefit from the expertise and the and the diagnosis that's here at memorial so for uh going back to the fda clearance which again you know is, is today can you give us a little bit more of an idea of what that means now and and how fast i guess that uh, pathologists and centers are able to incorporate in your technology the fda clearance today uh provides the ability for pathologists to look at a digital image using the page uh, digital slide viewer that's part of our enterprise imaging system. And if those slides are, are scanned on a Philips ultrafast scanner to be able to render that diagnosis digitally without having to go and look at it through a microscope. And what that means is that it opens up the possibility for not only pathologists to distribute work and to share cases uh, digitally, uh, be able to work from remote uh, CLIA approved labs, but it also provides the basis and the foundation for all of this advanced technology that leverages the pattern matching that we were just talking about. Looking at this, I mean, this sounds like just such a great use of artificial intelligence to help. I mean, the bottom line is to help people, right? And to help you know, cure some of these things or find treatments, you know, that's what I think everybody agrees is, is a great use of it. Um, looking at it going forward, you know, where you're at right now, how do you see this changing and, and augmenting things maybe like five years out? And I know that's hard to prognosticate, but just a, a kind of a, a guess of where you think this could go. Well, we envision a world in which uh, pathologists today uh, look at cases, they may not understand exactly what what some particular pattern is in that tissue, they, they may have questions or concerns about uh, trying to figure out what's going on in a particular case and have to talk to colleagues, have to send that case out for additional testing, maybe send it to another lab or another hospital for a second opinion. And those same pathologists will be able to render their diagnosis on a digital system and be able to benefit from having the computer do that matching with the enormous database and provide that information at their fingertips. As we go forward, we envision being able to link those patterns that we find to drug responses and ultimately to outcomes of different tumors and different treatments and make that information available to the pathologists as well so that they can make sure that every patient has the right treatment and, and the best outcome possible.
given today's uh, medication and therapy landscape. That's fantastic because I know, you know, as anybody's had encountered anybody with this, there's a myriad of different things that can be the right treatment, the wrong treatment for people, and each case is kind of specific. So that's wonderful if they're able to compare all this information. Um, to give everybody just a, some more idea, if they want to find out more too about everything that you're doing, and in particular this this new FDA clearance, uh, where would we send people to find out more information about this technology? They can go to our website where we have uh, not only information about the company, about the viewer and the enterprise imaging system, and uh, we are, are working with an expanding number of hospitals in the U.S. and worldwide, and we would love to be able to engage with hospitals or researchers that are interested in using this technology. Fantastic. Well, uh, Leo, I want to say thank you so much for joining us to talk about this. Congratulations on the FDA clearance. This sounds like technology that's really helping people, and I'm excited to see where this can go uh, to help out these pathologists and their diagnoses. And, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Greg. It's a real pleasure. Leo Grady, right there from Page, a really fantastic use of technology and artificial intelligence, looking at how it can actually help people out when it comes to the medical field. I mean, that's something that I think we can all agree, the more help, the better, and that is a great interview right there. All right, continuing on here with Digital Trends Live, coming up next, we've got our own Drew Prindle joining us for Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet, where he takes a look at some different crowdfunding campaigns. That's up next. Stick around back in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Digital Trends Live, I'm Greg Nibbler, and yes, indeed, it's time for Awesome Tech You Can't Buy Yet, where Drew Prindle scours the internet for some of the best, greatest, and sometimes strangest crowdfunding campaigns out there. Drew, hello, welcome back. Which one of these do you want to talk about first here today? Greg, let's talk about the Super Strata, that this crazy-looking bicycle. It's basically, it's a lot of things, but I guess the best way to sum it up is to call it, it's a 3D-printed, custom-sized, single body carbon fiber composite bike. So normally like carbon fiber bikes have been around for a long time, right? Like you can buy a carbon fiber frame right now, but the difference is they're made up of a bunch of different pieces. And like, while they're really great because they're super lightweight and typically pretty strong, they're also kind of fragile because they're just so rigid. So anybody who owns a carbon fiber bike now knows that if you take too hard of a hit, you crash into something you kind of just like the bike is ruined it doesn't just bounce back because it doesn't really flex very well um 
So the way that they've solved that with this is by 3D printing a single piece um, of carbon fiber. So there's no joints, there's no, there are way fewer failure points, just a much stronger bike. And also by 3D printing it, they can actually custom make it so that the size is perfect for you. And also because there are no like, you know, fixtures or uh, points where you can like, I need to bolt things together. It's even lighter than it would otherwise be. So the frame itself is under three pounds. Um, and it can also, they can also slip e-bike components into it. So they can fit a battery into the, uh, wow. into the body if you want it. And because it's so lightweight, it doesn't take a ton of energy to actually propel you forward. So it's just, this is definitely one of the craziest e-bikes that I have seen in uh, on crowdfunding platforms in the past few years. It's, it's absolutely nuts. I mean, I like the idea that you can custom print it to your height and size uh being yeah. someone of you know maybe a little shorter stature uh that would be uh that would be something that would be in a, of an advantage for me uh so so this is again the uh Str super strata bike a custom 3d printed unibody carbon fiber composite bike and e-bike and um, that is up crowdfunding right now it's already met 20 2601 percent of its goal so it looks like a lot of people want that's 2.6 million dollars funded right now yeah. so that one uh is doing doing pretty well uh, what is the uh, what is the next one you want to talk about? So let, let's keep with the bike theme. The uh, the next one we've got uh, the loop mount, which is really it's nothing crazy. It's just it's just a mount for your phone on your bike handles. And like like I said, this is something that's totally existed before. This isn't necessarily a new idea. The thing I love about this one though is that it's so discreet. Um, and it's just so simple. Like it, instead of you know forcing you to put something onto your phone so that you can attach it and it'll sit there. Like yeah, most mounts for your phone are just super clunky looking and awkward to use. But this yep. one's super minimalist and, don't and work simple. Well. Exactly. Um, but this one a works really well. It's designed to work with almost any phone um, that you throw at it. And also, when it's not in use, it doesn't look like. A phone mount. It doesn't look like something that's worth stealing, so you don't have to worry about it when you've you know got your bike bolted to uh, to the building or a telephone pole or something in a sketchy part of town. It just doesn't look like something that would be worthwhile to steal, even though it is uh, totally a awesome discreet little mount for your phone. I am 100% down with this one. I would definitely utilize this thing as long as it is like strong enough to keep it clamped in and not flying out when you go over a step or something or a curb then uh, yeah i'm in with this one so that's uh the loop mount and uh instant bike navigation when you need it so that one also um looks like it's oh yeah it's well met its goal but uh, still eight days to go on that one so again awesome tech you can't buy yet looking at awesome tech and let's go to this last one here this theory board thigh 333 is that really is that how you say that I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about the, uh, <laughs> the the like second name. I just called it the theory board. So once again, it, this thing is kind of a different take on something that already, already exists. So I'm sure you've seen like MIDI controllers and drum pads and all of these like new age music production tools that are out there right now. Um, this is a little bit different than those. So usually the way that those work is by basically allowing you to make any sound you want in, you know, computer program or synthesizer or whatever and then you can map that sound to a specific button or a, an effect to that button um, which basically just makes that pad into like a super customizable keyboard of sorts right um, but the theory board is a little bit different than that it doesn't just let you map any note to any pad it actually teaches you music theory um, and makes it easier to make good sounding music so Basically, it does this by putting all the notes in a given scale on one side and allowing you to switch different scales. And like, say if you play a chord on one side of the board, it instantaneously maps all the notes in that chord scale to the other side so you can kind of play matching notes that sound good. And this is one, though, I will say you kind of need to watch the video because it goes super in-depth and it, it's, it looks really, really impressive. Just take my word on it. This is not your average MIDI controller. It does look cool. It also feels like cheating, but um, I think I have to get over that. But, but that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. So that is the Theory Board uh, Music Theory MIDI Controller 
um, right there and all part of Awesome Tech. And we've got all of these too up on digitaltrends.com where people can go and take a look at all the different awesome tech that Drew finds here with all these crowdfunding campaigns. Always interesting ones. Uh, I think I do want to get the phone holder, the loop mount, so I'm probably going to pledge on that one. But Drew, as always, good to see you. I'll talk to you soon. Later, man. Drew Prindle right there who finds all of these really interesting stuff. So check out that and all the other ones that he's got there at digitaltrends.com. All right, we need to go to a break because uh, we've got a great guest who's going to be joining us next. Um, I'm a huge fan um, from both the following and Rome, and he's got uh, I mean, Alter Carbon, and he's got a new movie called Fisherman's Friends. We've got James Purefoy who's going to be joining us next. Stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and again, thank you for joining us wherever you are. Hit that subscribe button. Join the show here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And I am very excited for our next guest. The new movie, Fisherman's Friends, releases on digital and on demand on July 24th and tells the tale of a music executive trying to sign a group of fishermen who sing sea shanties to a music contract. And we have one of the stars of that said movie right now, James Purefoy, joining us. James, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. You are live from my veg patch. I gotta say, yeah, that is a great backdrop. That's probably one of the best ones we've seen. Where are yeah, you right it's now? All, it's entirely fake. Hang on. <laughs> all right, it's, no, it's still looking, looking I'm good. In, I'm in the west. I'm in the west country of England, not far from where Fisherman's Friends were filmed. 
Well, speaking of Fisherman's Friends, you know, and with this, it's based on a true story as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story and what do you do to prepare for something when you're playing actual people? Okay, uh, so the film is about these guys called, uh, they're part of a band called the Fisherman's Friends. Uh, and this is not a story about the throat lozenge. Um, it, that would not be an interesting film. However, it is an interesting film. It's about a band of fishermen who uh, created this group uh, to sing sea shanties. And every Friday night, they would sing on the harbour wall in this very small uh, Cornish village called Port Isaac. And they'd get maybe 100 people watching. And then one day, a music executive from Island Records came down to visit them, uh, to visit on holiday, on vacation, saw them, and uh, signed them. And an incredibly unlikely story is that they went in to number six or seven in the album charts in the UK, and they regularly now tour and have made, I think, four or five albums. They, for the first one, went platinum. It is a remarkable story, and I play Jim, who is the the leader of the Fisherman's Friends, the singing group. Um, that's incredible as a story alone. Now, when it comes with to, to fishermen in particular, I mean, and I think this is true worldwide, there are a lot of superstitions that come into play. And even in the trailer uh -huh. for the movie, it kind of highlights some of those. Uh, when you're studying for this, what were some of the weirdest superstitions that you found out about with fishermen? Um, okay, you're not allowed to wear green on a boat. Who knew? Uh, I didn't. Um, you're not allowed to wear green because otherwise it feels as if the land is calling you back to land. You're not allowed to have a woman on board, but, you know, in the silly old olden days, obviously. Um, there are just a number of strange things. You can't say certain words. You can't whistle. You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, it's a job, in fact, to find out what you can do on a boat. That's, yeah, that is, uh, <laughs> that's a lot to try to uh, handle when you're getting onto that. Well, looking at this, uh, something else I want to ask about, you know, and, and yeah. switching to tech just for a minute. And you, yeah, you know, being an altered carbon, which is obviously a futuristic tech world where you can switch uh -huh. bodies. When you're doing something like that, when it comes to technology, what is one piece of tech from that that you wish you had now? Oh, do you know what? I was just looking at it just this morning. Um, there was a ring that we wore called the Oni ring, which is a black piece of like anthracite or something like that, that had been digitally um, uh, played with and altered and put uh, chips in it. And you could create uh, holograms of whatever you want to create a hologram of. It did and it, it transferred into your head and read your thoughts so that you could then have a hologram of whoever you were thinking of right in front of you talking to you. I kind of fancied the only thing that would be a cool thing to have. That would absolutely be a cool thing to have. Um, right now in the modern era, uh, what is the one piece of tech that you wouldn't be able to live without? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm bored already by my answer. My phone, I think. I think my phone would be, it would be hard for me now. I, I think I, I do so much on it as we all do. You know, to go back to a typewriter, I found one under the bed here the other day. Incredible thing. An Olivetti typewriter. It's a be thing of great beauty. We started it up. My daughter played with it for like three minutes and then we junk it. But, uh, you know, but who would want to go back to typewriters? Who'd want to go back to ink? Who'd want to go back to, you know, threading that carbon ribbon around again? No. No. Well... Something else, you mentioned your phone, and I know that you're uh, very active on social media, on Twitter. And just to give you kind of a, a, a big question here, um, how do you feel that social media should moderate their content on their platforms? Ooh, well, Peter, uh, how should they moderate? Uh, I feel very strongly, and I think a lot of people do, that Twitter seems to be going down the right route. Um, Facebook, you know. I, if you are a, a, a publisher of lies and if you're a publisher of falsehoods, you really need to pay attention to that. And it doesn't matter how big you are or how rich you are, or how many households you reach. You can't go around spreading lies. You can't go around spreading mistruths. You can't go around to allowing people to use your publishing platform to tell 
terrible, filthy lies that have massive world, world global effect. I think Facebook needs to look Fair into enough. that. We all do. I think I think we all feel that Facebook are are dodging this one. Yeah, and I, I, that feels like a, a, an answer that we've heard from a few people with that. Um, something else I wanted to ask you, and this is you know kind of bouncing all over, but switching gears. And this mm -hmm. is important because I saw this in entertainment. There is was recently cast an artificially intelligent robot named Erica to play a lead role in a major Get Hollywood here. film. How would no way? It's true. Yes, it, you can look it up. Yep, it's a, the, the robot is named end. Erica. It's being. <laughs> it's being trained yeah by actors to act with other people how would you feel about acting with a robot well you know i don't believe they can do it i don't think they'd be fast enough i don't think that they'll be nuanced enough i think you know even now the best video games you can still tell it's a video game the best best ones you can still tell it's a video game so, um, you know, it doesn't look real to me. I, I, I even in that Martin Scorsese film recently, I, I thought I just didn't buy any of those special effects. I just didn't believe them when they looked young. You know, many years ago I was doing, or a few years ago I was doing um, a movie called John Carter for Disney. And they did one of those extraordinary things where they, um, they laser map you and photograph you for 100, 360 degrees. So somewhere at Disney, is me looking much younger and much more handsome and really fit, sadly. And um, I'd like to get hold of that <laughs> and put that in my new movies. <laughs> That's clearly the way to go. How would you feel about, yeah, your image being used in a movie like that? I think it'd be fine as long as I had Final Cut. Unlikely, let's face it, but... If I had, if they, if I could absolutely say oh, you can use it or not, um, depending on how well I thought they'd done it, I think I'd be fine. There we go, James. Uh, one last uh, question here that I just wanted to ask. You know, your your character yeah. Joe Carroll, and I watched the following, and I, I love that movie. Your, I saw somebody else actually quote you as being kind of a magnificent bastard in that, uh, which I think is, mm -hmm. is adequate. Um, yeah. For that role, is is that something you would want, ever want to revisit? No, no. It was a very dark place, and I'd done it for three years. And by the time we'd got to the end of the third season, it had seeped into my unconscious in a way that I was not welcome. Um, uh, both Kevin, Kevin, uh, Kevin, and I had you would have nightmares about that show. Um, and I think that once it gets into that place, it's it's a it's a dark vortex, and I'd spent three years playing the most nihilistic and difficult character I've ever played. So um, I was kind of done. Fair enough. I mean, you did play it well, so that's uh, I can only imagine. Well, thank well, you very much. This... It's very kind of you. Oh, I mean, it was it was great. Um, you Good. were terrifying. But uh, talking about uh, Fisherman's Friends, uh, going back to that. So it's out on digital right now. What would you like people to take away from watching that movie? Do you know, I think that we live in a, a time where some politicians seek to divide a lot, divide us and, and render us apart. This is a film about communities coming together. It's about a community and people and friends and love and kindness. And I think we need a lot more of that to be going on with. And that this will put a smile on your face and a little spring in your step and it will make you, make you feel happy that you're part of the human race again because um, there's an awful lot going on at the moment which doesn't make us feel happy about being part of the human race. Well, James, I love that idea and that is absolutely something I think that we can all use right now. And you are a yeah. pleasure. Thank you so much for being here on the show. Thank with you us so much. Talking about sir. this. Yeah, James. Thank Purefoy. you so much for all having right, me. And, friends. And, yeah, take care. Bye. Yeah, thanks for having us in your uh, veggie patch. Uh, all right, James Purefoy right here. And again, Fisherman's Friends, it is out on digital. So I want to emphasize that too. July 24th is when it is coming out. So you can uh, catch it on there on digital, on demand. Uh, really appreciate them being here on the show. 
And, uh, and yeah, definitely watch that movie. It sounds like it's uplifting something that we all need right now. All right, continuing on here with Digital Trends Lab, I know we've got more guests on the way, and I wanna say, uh, again, thank you to everybody who's joining us, who's watching live, wherever you are, wherever you may be. Uh, coming up next, we've got our full screen segment, Who's Got Game, where we're gonna be joined by Reggie Weber. So Reggie Weber is gonna be here right after this. Stick around back in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. <laughs> Back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. It is indeed time for Who's Got Game, our segment with Full Screen, where we partner with their talented, creative uh, YouTubers, gamers, all kinds of things, entertainers who join us here for the show. And joining us right now, we have Reggie Weber. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. How are you? Doing good. Um, I believe we've had your roommate on before. Yeah, Kevin. I think he uh, was on just a couple weeks ago. He was indeed. Well, uh, Reggie, for uh, you, I, we always like to start off and just like talk to everybody who is in this field about how it is you got into this, where your beginning was that you decided that you wanted to get into entertainment and posting videos on YouTube and doing all of this. Yeah, of course. Well, so it started actually in high school. We were all required to take a video editing class. And most people kind of took this class just as a joke. But then uh, my brother and I realized like we took this so serious, just making like funny videos. And that was just like the funnest thing that we did all through school is just being able to show our class our videos and stuff like that. So uh, it kind of made us realize that YouTube was what we wanted to do. Do you remember what the first video was that you posted to YouTube? My first video? Yeah, it was like a birthday prank on one of my old roommates back in Kansas. <laughs> it's pretty rough, but uh, it's nice to look back and see how far I've grown since then. Well, talking about that, you know, and, and growing, you know, starting from a class in high school and posting a prank to, you know, of your buddy at a birthday party. Um, <laughs> where was the moment when you, when you realized like, okay, this is what I'm going to do, you know, for a living? Um, so, well, so my brother started YouTube a long time before me and I just didn't do it. I just didn't have the guts to do it. But once I posted that first video and I got a response from it, even though it only had like maybe a hundred views, um, it just felt like I, I felt so good about it that, uh, that's kind of when I realized, like, okay, I'm sticking with this. So you knew all right, right from the beginning. You're like, this is this is what I'm doing. Pretty much, yeah. It was actually like while I was editing that video, I was like, okay, this feels right. That's good for you for knowing that quick. Thank you so um, much. Going from that, you know, and posting and posting that video, uh, getting into the gaming side of things. Which was the first games that you started playing? Oh, you mean like for uh, my channel or just as a child? For your channel. For my channel, oh, uh, 
So I think the first games I played was actually just VR. Just kind of, I remember watching a lot of VR YouTubers, and that's what inspired me to get one. So I was like, wow, I want to do that so bad. And uh, yeah, I just started playing. Um, there's a game called Job Simulator where it runs you through a different jo- bunch of like sets of jobs, like a chef or an office worker, and that one was so much fun to play. And uh, yeah, I kind of moved on to more scary stuff now. Yeah, I was gonna say I watched one of the videos where you um, scared Kevin with some different VR games. Can you talk <laughs> yeah. about what games those were? Like, what is the scariest game you have ever played in virtual reality? Uh, so the ones I showed Kevin, those were just like immersive, scary 360 videos. So wherever you look, like you're still in the world. So it's so scary. But uh, the scariest one I probably played was uh, this Paranormal Activity game, or. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. It's not super scary, but it's just so stressful. I just can't do it. <laughs> there is something <laughs> about paranormal activity because you can't see it. That is absolutely the scariest thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, looking from from there, talking about you know, uh, for other people who want to follow like in your footsteps, what ins- what kind of guidance or words of inspiration would you have for somebody out there who's maybe the young Reggie wanting to get into creating content? Um, if that's what you really want to do, I would just say the biggest step for me was just staying consistent. Even just, even if your videos are getting zero views for an, a year straight, as long as you keep posting, like you're on an amazing track. Just staying consistent, consistently trying to be innovative. That's, those are just the most two important things, I believe. Um, something else to ask when it comes to Minecraft. Uh, have you been participating in any of the events that have been going on in Minecraft during this pandemic, which is just crazy how many of that's been happening, how many of those have been going on, but have no. you participated in any of the events in Minecraft? No, unfortunately, I haven't really been playing Minecraft too much. Uh, I got stuck on VR, Call of Duty, stuff like that, so I need to go back to Minecraft so bad. But <laughs> I haven't this yet. I haven't this quarantine yet, but I plan on it. Uh, when it comes to, you mentioned Call of Duty um, that you're playing and, and VR. Are there any games out there that you want to try that you haven't gotten to yet? Um, I pretty much, I'm just open to trying all scary games on VR. That's kind of like what I'm really interested in at the moment. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking into uh, a lot more horror side of games. I just started my channel membership, so I'm streaming a lot there. So I've been looking around trying to find like a bunch of kind of hidden weird gems to play on there. Um, talking about horror, I want to ask you something. If you could rank in order from scariest to least scariest, go from Freddy Krueger, Jason, or Mike, Michael Myers, which one's the scariest, which is least scariest? Um, I would say the scariest has got to be Freddy because he enters your dreams. There's no avoiding him. I might be able to run faster than Jason because he's a pretty big dude. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that, actually. He kind of makes me scared of the wilderness. So I'd have to say Jason's next. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> that would be the top three for me. OK. All right. Well, I, I agree. <laughs> Freddie can get in your dreams. I mean, there's no getting away from that. So that just makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no avoiding him. Um, <laughs> well, for your channel now, what, uh, what can people look forward to that's coming up? Um, well, I just started my channel memberships, like I mentioned earlier. So that's something I'm really uh, mm-hmm. putting a lot of work into, trying to make that like as fun as possible. And uh, I've been live streaming there multiple times a week, so it's a lot of fun. I think if there's one thing on my channel to check out, that's definitely the thing to check out right now. Nice. And so that's just exclusive stuff that people can get. So you're live streaming. What's an example of some things that you're live streaming? Well, uh, an example of something I live streamed the other day was uh, it's this game. This guy logged his dreams for 10 years, dreams and nightmares. And then he made this obscure PlayStation 1 game based off of all of his dreams. And uh, I've just been kind of exploring that game recently. It's really creepy and fun. That sounds really creepy. Yeah. (laughs) It is is very creepy. Yeah, I want to see that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Reggie, um, you know, thank you so much for joining us, too, to talk about this. Of course, thank you so much Uh, for having me. One thing I did have... What, my one final question is, who do you think is better at pranking, you or Kevin? Oh, me without a doubt. Kevin just doesn't have what it takes to prank. I, I know what it takes. He's a, I think he's kind of like a little brother to me. Like, he kind of just follows, even though he's older than me, you know, he kind of looks up to my pranking abilities. I, hope, I think that maybe one day he'll get there. Nice. You can give him some words <laughs> of advice then. 
Uh, <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> all right, Reggie, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Everybody go subscribe. Of check out your content. Check out your specific content. And uh, thanks for being here with us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Reggie Weber right here on Digital Trends Live. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us on Digital Trends Live. We broadcast live every single weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, and we bring you those trending tech headlines at the top of the show, but also these great interviews. And so thanks for being a part of this with us. And as usual, we've got a lot coming up this week, and I appreciate uh, you being a part of it. Some great interviews are on the way. I'm just going to say some people that you're going to know that are going to be joining this show. So that's why you want to hit subscribe. Make sure that you're a part of it every single day. Share the show. Let other people know about it. And thanks for tuning in. Oh, one other thing. Coming up later on today, 2.30 p.m. Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, will be our Roundtable Tech Podcast, Trends with Benefits. So you want to join that as well. There will be four of us here kind of talking about actually education and technology and how it's changing and how tech can either save it or is it a hindrance? What's going to be going on there? We're going to kind of get a discussion going about that, give you some information, and we want to hear your opinions. So join the show. All right, I'm Greg Nibbler, and I'll be right back here tomorrow with another edition of Digital Trends Live.